good morning. So I'm delighted to be here again today. And today we have a very interesting legal business development topic, which we're going to continue from last time. We're looking at the topic of pitching. And as we might remember from the previous two sessions, which we had this month on pitching, pitching one and pitching two, pitching is about creating a value proposition, creating an offer, and then proposing that to a client or a potential client. In the previous sessions, we saw that generally there are two types of pitching. You have solicited pitching, which is when your client or potential client asks you to make them a proposal. Uh, with law firms, this is very often via an RFP, a request for a proposal. They come to us, they come to some other law firms, and they ask us to make a proposal, and we pitch them. That's solicited pitching. And the other type of pitching, the one which I was more encouraging, is unsolicited pitching, or perhaps we can call this spontaneous pitching. And this is where we ourselves, as a law firm, as a legal practice, this would work for other professional services firms. You create an offer, and at your initiative, you then propose it to a client or a potential client. And like I was saying, unsurprisingly, last time, I would strongly recommend that you don't only follow solicited pitching. A lot of law firms are not doing proactive pitching. They're not doing spontaneous pitching. Um, it would be a good idea to do this. If you are only responding to RFPs, you find yourself at the mercy of a purchasing department. You find yourself competing with other law firms and there will always be somebody cheaper. If the client, the potential client is gonna be money oriented, they will find someone cheaper and you will lose. We know that we mustn't get into price competition. We mustn't be offering discounts. So it's gonna be quite difficult to win the solicited pitching. So the solution there, which I was recommending, is you go into unsolicited pitching, spontaneous pitching. Today, we're going to continue the topic of pitching, and we're going to be looking at uh, how do we deal with the most difficult type of pitching, which is when you're not doing this safely by email, you actually have to do this in person. This is called a beauty parade, or rather kind of sexist terminology. I think this becomes um, the case because a lot of this vocabulary is from maybe 1950s America, where these different sales concepts perhaps originated. And a beauty parade, that is when a client comes to you and they ask, why should we work with your law firm? And then maybe you don't know about it. They go to the next law firm and the next law firm and they ask them this question. So that would be an example of an invisible beauty parade. It isn't so stressful for us as lawyers or partners because we might not even know that it's happening. We might think this is just a potential client who's interested in potentially working with our law firm. However, as a sales expert, you need to be ready for the situation where you are participating in a visible beauty parade. And in this case, you're invited to one place, and so are some competing lawyers. You have your 10 or 20 or 30 minute slot. You have to get up there, present your legal practice, maybe with PowerPoint, maybe without, do some Q&A, questions and answers, and then the next competitor does it, and the next competitor, and the next competitor, and then that client chooses the winner. So this can be actually quite challenging for lawyers, because not only do you need to have public speaking and presentation skills, but you also need to have the sales skills, the pitching skills as well. So... I understand that a lot of the European lawyers in particular, they prefer a soft sell approach. And that's fine if you're going to have tea for two, you're taking a current client to lunch, you have a potential client, you take them to dinner, and you have this kind of 
relaxed conversation. It's quasi social. You might tell some war stories. You might slip some value propositions into the conversation. It's very relaxed and it's calm and it's cool. And I would agree with these European lawyers that if you started doing a hard sell, aggressively pitching about your legal practice and your expertise, you would simply alienate and lose that potential client. But you need to be able to do the hard sell. You need to be able to do a strong personal pitch. You need to be able to do that, that if you're invited to a beauty parade, that you can stand up and you can really answer the question, why should we work with you? And you have five minutes or maybe you have 30 minutes, but you need to be able to make that kind of pitch in non-plain vanilla terms. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. No pressure. <laughs> Uh, as normal, you can see, you can see here, you can see that we have the 16 key concepts. Each of them are associated with a pictogram and the idea being quite simple. At the end of the lecture, if I show you the pictogram and you can explain what that's about, it means you have learned the concept. If you can't, then you haven't. So for concept checking on the key ideas in the lecture, this is a kind of good idea. This is something which I created some time ago. So we're going to spend most of today's session dealing with the spoken pitch, specifically that which you would use in a visible beauty parade. However, come to think of it, a lot of these concepts, a lot of these ideas, especially since it's going to be dealing not just with how you speak, but about your presentation, your aura, your eminence, your body language, your gesticulation. A lot of these concepts will apply when you do soft pitching at lunch. So if you do tea marketing, tea for two, tea for three, you know, um, and that, then it can help you. And um, even when you go into a networking event, you know, you go to a conference or an exhibition and you meet people, these concepts will help you as well. So I think it's generally useful. Before we continue further, let me drop a little advert into the conversation. If you, um, if you email me, this is my email address, I can send you a copy of these slides. And if you have a copy of these slides, you can see that we've put in some hyperlinks. So for example, one of the products which I developed back in 2019 before the pandemic, actually 2018, 2019, is this. I don't know if you can see it, not very good visibility, uh, the Nicodonia concept cards. So in the same way, that we have the 16 key concepts today where you have the pictogram, which is associated with an idea. We created these cards. This box has 128 of them. So that's eight topics, each of 16 concepts, where you have the concept. This one's the LTD mistake and the explanation of the concept. I don't know if you can see that. So the paragraph explaining what it is. And the idea is that if you play with these cards and then you begin to learn, the association between the pictogram and the concept, you can basically get these 128 key ideas into long-term pictographic memory association and know them. So that's the equivalent of eight of my textbooks. That would be quite a few lectures indeed. Uh, if you want to get that, you can order it. They cost 100 euros per box. And there's a nice little advert in me explaining the idea. And another little pitch. In the previous session, I was being very blunt with you. I was saying probably your pitches, when you respond to an RFP, they do not differ from your competitors. Most of the pitches from law firms are plain vanilla. They're saying the same things. Full service law firm, good geographical coverage, highly talented lawyers, well ranked in legal 500 and chambers. It's not going to win because your competitors are going to be saying the same kind of things. So I put together the 24 best pitch elements checklist. It's a five, six page legal sales document that I wrote. And it shows 12 pitch content elements, which can make you stand out from your competitors, and 12 pitch sales elements, which can help you to stand out from your competitors, because you can't and you mustn't compete in price. Don't do that. You can't do that. You mustn't do that. You mustn't be giving discounts. Um, and it's very difficult to be competing in terms of quality of legal services, because while you're good, your competitors are good as well. So how can you win? 
well, I'll show you how you win. You you um, contact me and you can drop me an email and we can discuss this uh, suggestion, the 24 best pitch elements checklist. And these are the ideas that I gained from working with dozens, hundreds of law firms in different countries. Mm, it's actually quite interesting. Now, coming back to today's topic, we're going to look at beauty parade pitching. Um, and how do we how do we actually win with this? So, of course, you have to understand that as a lawyer, as you progress in your career, you're going to have higher and more challenging expectations placed on you from a sales perspective. While beauty parade pitching isn't something that's probably going to impact a junior associate or maybe even an associate, when you get to senior associate or partner level, you need to be able to do this and you need to be able to do it well and you need to be able to win with it. How many lawyers have had sales training? Very few. How many lawyers have had pitching training? And I don't just mean spoken presentations or public speaking. Some lawyers get that kind of training. But how do you win in terms of beauty parade pitching? Almost nobody has had this training. Contact me. I can do it for you. I can do it with you. Because as you progress in your career over time, the number of business development hours will actually increase and the number of billable hours will decrease. So if you're an associate or a junior associate, maybe one or two hours per week, you fix that time on your outlook, on your calendar, and that's the time that you spend doing business development. You do this systematically on a weekly basis. And your billable hours, you build around that. Now, as you progress in your career, by the time you become a senior associate, maybe it would be two, three, four hours per week, maybe an hour per day. When you're a partner, it might be one or two hours per day. It might be 50% of your time doing business development. And in some of the American law firms at the level of managing partner, you don't do billable hours anymore. You're only doing, well, some law firm management and the rest is business development. So um, what's the moral to take away from this story? If you're not doing business development, you should. <laughs> and the more senior that you are, the more of it you should be doing. Um, and you need to understand your own motivations for doing this. If you're not convinced to do it, you're not going to do it. Um, I, I shared that paper. I have that paper. You can email me if you want it. The 10 most common motivations to do business development. It's in your own interest to do this. You know, this is very, very important. And pitching, pitching is probably the heart of sales. Can you pitch? Can you speak to someone? Can you email someone? Can you make a value proposition and propose it to a key decision maker and get a sale? That's what you need to be able to do. Um, when you are doing spoken in-person pitching, we know that there are spheres of space. We know that we have the intimate space, which is very close to a person. We have the intermediary space, which is further, and the distant space. Now, if you're gonna do a beauty parade, if you're going to do a spoken pitch, you don't want to make sure, you want to make sure that there's no barriers between you and the prospect. That means you shouldn't be defensive and have, you know, have something that you're holding to protect yourself. You shouldn't be standing behind a lecture, a lectern, uh, behind a table, and you should be coming into their physical space and maybe moving away. You should be moving around a little bit. That's going to keep their attention on you. I think you might have seen this in TED Talks you notice that the speaker, they might wander around the stage a little bit. That keeps people's eyes on them. It keeps them watching. And if you're doing a beauty parade and you have these people sitting at a table watching you, you can come closer to them. You can invade their space and then you can move away. Um, you know, So be aware of the spheres of space. Don't keep a distance. Try to be close. If it's going to be uncomfortable to be too close, go in and out of the physical space. That keeps the engagement with them. And you need to occupy the space. You need to take the space around you because this shows confidence and <clears throat> certainty. The body language in pitching is extremely important. We know that perhaps 70% of your communication is nothing that you're saying. It's not the stuff coming out of your mouth. It's not the words. It might be your intonation. It might be your facial expression. It's going to be your gesticulation and so on. So occupy the space. You need to be big. You need to be expansive. You, you mustn't be folded armed 
and defensive. You need to have your arms out. You occupy the space. You stand straight, chest out. Makes you look confident and aware. This is going to be a good thing. Um, you know, it it actually not only does it make you look more confident, but by doing this, it gives you confidence. You'll have seen this on on television before about politicians and so on. Before they do a speech, they they take power poses. You do breathing exercises, do this. You mustn't be hunched up and defensive and timid and hiding behind a paper. I've seen lawyers do this. It's really terrible. Don't do that. You've got to look confident because you only have seven seconds to make a first impression. The first impression is extremely important, extremely important. Look happy to be there. Smile, be confident, look them in the eye, have open body language, show your hands. Um, for example, there was a study where the uh, clients went to a restaurant, and if a waiter smiled and began the conversation, greeted them and said a nice comment, such as wonderful weather that they were having, the tips that such a waiter gets is actually higher. Unsurprisingly, those few seconds, those first impressions, they can make a difference on the rest of your consultation and your chance of conversion and the financial remuneration at the end. So you've got to have a very strong, powerful beginning. So start high. And of course, part of that would be the handshake. Don't be super macho and crush their hands. Don't have a dead fish as your handshake. Normal handshake, look them in the eye, smile, say some sweet words while you're shaking their hands. Be charming. Shake hands. Lovely to meet you. I'm so glad to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. <laughs> you know, be charismatic. Have a, have a nice, strong handshake. Um, be aware that sometimes someone can try and exert dominance through the handshake. They might put the second hand on top of your hand and they might shake it. They can get away with that if they are a managing partner. If they're a big CEO, they're trying to be super charming, let them do it. You might try and do that. It depends on your age and your seniority. If you can get away with it, then by all means do so. Show super confidence. Your hands are extremely important. They're extremely important for the communication. When you're talking, I really wouldn't even recommend that during a beauty parade that you had a PowerPoint presentation at all, at all. You know, previously I would have said before the pandemic, you can have a presentation, maybe three or four slides and it should be visual information. Now I've changed my mind, no presentation at all. All eyes on you, all eyes on you. You are the center of attention, you're the seller, you're the pitcher, and it's you who is gonna be communicating both with your face and with your gesticulation. You must have open hands. Open hands show honesty and transparency and credibility. You can gesticulate. You know, you don't wanna to go totally crazy here, you know, like um, very stereotypically, I don't know, Southern, Southern European, Mediterranean. But if you're coming from a Northern European culture or a culture which is a little bit more conservative when it comes to the body language, change that. Be expressive. Your communication by hands is extremely important. It adds a lot of value to what you're saying. It helps. It helps people to follow track of what you're saying. So, you know, communicate and with the hands and with the voice. And an extreme example of this is something called kino. Kino means the kinesthetic approach. And this means basically touching. Now, this is a dangerous topic, of course. This is a dangerous topic. And we're lawyers. We know that you don't want to be inappropriately touching people, getting accused of harassment and, and all of that kind of thing. So be, be careful here. Uh, Kino is when, for example, if you have a teacher and a student, a little tap on the shoulder can ground the student. The student will pay attention. It'll make them focus. Uh, the waitress or the waiter, you know, someone giving a little tap as you go past, that's a, like a friendly sign, perhaps. That can create a stronger emotional bond. Um, yeah, we need to be careful about it. Why would I tell you about Kino? It's up to you if you want to risk trying to apply this. So do so with care. But it's also interesting for you to know that if someone has studied body language and if someone has studied spoken and uh, visible pitching, like what we're doing now, they will know about Kino. So if you get a little tap, you know, someone shakes your hand and then they 
pat you on the shoulder, that's what might be happening. This might be Kino. It's not necessarily accidental. Um, I've written a book. I've written another book <laughs> about body language related to sales. Um, that's one of my training topics. You're, if you're interested, you can you can contact me about it. So, yeah, I think Kino has its place and it can work, but you've got to be careful. Let's put it that way. And of course, be careful not only about touching other people, about touching yourself. If you're doing a presentation and you're touching your, your face, you're touching your nose, your lips, this can make you look unconfident. It can make you look dishonest. If someone is touching their lips and the other person has a primitive understanding of body language, they read some articles on, on internet about it, they're going to think, oh, they're touching their lips, it means they're lying. You know, they folded their arms, it means they're they're defensive. Not necessarily. They're folding their arms because they're cold. They're touching their lips because they're just thinking. Or maybe they're touching their nose because they have an itchy nose. Be careful not to overanalyze and overinterpret body language. As lawyers, when it comes to pitching, the classic mistake is that we get so absorbed into the legal details of what we're talking about, we have zero awareness of our own body language and that of other people. We're not paying attention. So the first thing to do is pay attention, open your eyes, be aware of what's happening, know some of the theory, learn these key concepts, and then the next level is you can begin to apply it. Uh, if someone is just touches their nose, it doesn't mean they're lying, not necessarily. If they're touching their nose a few times and their lips, and this is in correspondence with some other different body language and their feet are pointing away from you and they're looking to the left and above, then yes, maybe that in indicate something isn't so honest but uh be careful not to over interpret so generally don't touch your face when you're doing a pitch uh you you're gonna distract people by doing that you can however create a sense of trust and secrecy uh, with a conspirational lean in. So this can work in a, <laughs> I just touch my nose. <laughs> this can work in a um, sales networking environment. Uh, it can actually work in a beauty parade. If you lower your voice and you make eye contact and you whisper something to them, it shows that you're sharing a secret. This can be a way to get closer intimacy uh, with the with the prospect without necessarily getting straight into their personal space and without the extreme nature of a kinesthetic approach applying kino. Uh, so the lean in that can that can actually be quite useful. And you're not doing this accidentally. It's a little bit of a game. It works. You can try it. Probably someone's tried it on you and you haven't noticed what's going on. Because a lot of the body language and about how to apply it, less is more. Uh, it's about the subtle moves. Um, it's about, you know, raising your eyebrows intentionally. That means you're surprised or you have a question. It's about pursing your lips. It means you disagree. And the other person will respond to these. It's actually quite interesting. You can play this as a game as well. You know, you can tilt your head. People catch this body language and they respond to it. Um, it's much more powerful and effective in communication than people realize. You don't need to necessarily even talk to communicate and to get them to go further in the way that you want when you're when you're dis discussing things with them. So be aware of the subtle moves. In the slides, I've listed eight or ten of them. You, When you're aware of them, you can notice them. Even better, when you're aware of them, you can apply them. And an extreme example of this is mirroring. Be careful because sometimes lawyers read about mirroring and they apply it far too far too obviously and then it looks funny. Mirroring means that if you reflect and copy the body language of the other person, like a mirror, you get a closer emotional bond to them. And if you do this well, you start with mirroring them and then you take the lead and then they begin to mirror you. If you're at the end of your sales consultation, at the end of your beauty parade, and you're going to be moving towards the stage of trial close and close, where the close is you're asking for a purchase decision. This is difficult, but you got to do it. The trial close is where you're asking for their opinion to test the water, to see if there's any objections. So we know that in sales and in, in good pitching, you should drop in a few trial closes into your conversation to see if there's any objections, 
while you're mirroring them to make sure you're on the same level. And once you, they are mirroring you, then only when they are mirroring you, you would then go to your clothes and you would say to them, so do we have a deal? So shall we start on Monday? Please sign here. And you give them the document. So be aware of mirroring. You take the lead in mirroring after that you have mirrored them. And then at the closing stage, when they're mirroring you, that's when you try to close. If you do this effectively, you incorporate mirroring and taking the lead in mirroring with trial, close and close, your conversion will basically more than double. Another interesting point is something called spontaneous trait transference. And that means that in a pitch or in a conversation at a sales networking event, whatever you're saying about someone else will be seen as applying to you. So if you begin to say, oh, this law firm is very dishonest, they're sneaky, they do these dodgy things, we don't like them, these negative vibes that you're passing out will actually then also apply to you. So therefore, a smarter approach to take would be if you encounter the other lawyer objection, that the client is saying to you, the potential client, that they already have another legal provider for such and such work and they're happy with them, you should be saying sweet words. You say good things about that other legal provider. It makes you yourself look good. And you then can talk about, you say, but, killer but, which kills the sweet words you said before. You mention your good value proposition, your competitive advantage, your product value proposition, something you can offer. And then that's how you can overcome the other lawyer objection. So be careful with spontaneous trade transference that whatever you say about someone else can then be interpreted and attached to you. If you throw mud, mud sticks and mud sticks on you, not just the person you're throwing it at. If you're saying compliments, some of these good vibes and that nice karma stays with you. So be aware of it. An interesting example of this is when you say to the client some compliment, you give them some tangible praise, you call them a star, you're giving them a positive label. People like positive labels and people want to live up to the positive label. So if you're saying to um, an existing client, let's say, and you're participating in a beauty parade with them for a new piece of work because they have to do a tender among some other legal providers, um, if you say to them, yes, we were delighted to be working with you guys because you were always so timely with the submission of your documentation, you're the most timely of all of our clients. People like that, and they are more likely then to repeat that action to reinforce this praise that you've given them. If you, there was a study, there was um, some lawyers, they went to an event and it was about fundraising and they told one of their, their clients, you guys are the most generous, or among the most generous uh, with you, uh, with us in, um, in our jurisdiction that increased the amount of funding and support that they received. So tell someone a positive trait, people want to live up to that positive trait, and you can encourage it. Is it manipulative? Maybe, I don't know. Um, I don't think it's harmful. And of course, like I mentioned, you start high in your presentation in your beauty parade and you have to end high you have those first seven seconds to make a good first impression a strong impression and at the end you end with a bang you end with a boom you end with some something really interesting when we were looking at public speaking a few lectures ago we saw the concept of tying the hooks so if you begin with an anecdote and then at the end you finish with the anecdote that nicely encapsulates what your pitch was about. Uh, that shows that there's an ending. You have a strong ending. Begin a story at the start. You finish a story at the end. That's how you start high or end high. Have an inspirational, motivational call to action at the end. The beginning and the end of your pitch are the most important parts. So you need to make sure you start high, end high. What did I usually see, however, when I took part in different pitches, uh, this was when I was helping law firms with RFPs, and I would be on the side of the company receiving the beauty parade spoken pitch. Quite often, the pitches were dull. People would begin by saying, hello, my name is such and such. I'm a lawyer from this company. They would inflict on us death by PowerPoint. Presentation, 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 all plain vanilla generic stuff, nicely branded. 
doesn't differentiate from competitors. And at the end, they would say, thank you. No, dull as hell. Do not do that. Do not do that. Start high, end high. And of course, when you're doing a beauty raid, it is possible to not do this by yourself. Let's say you have a legal practice and you don't have tax advisory. You could bring one of your friends from another company as your tax advisor and offer an integrated tax and legal solution, even if you don't provide this yourself. That would be matchmaking for the pitch receiver. You're introducing somebody else. Uh, that would be a T for three. This is a good idea. This would give you a competitive advantage over the other providers who are just offering legal services. It also gives value to them that you're introducing someone else in your jurisdiction to that client, somebody useful. So matchmaking is a good idea. A lot of lawyers and partners are not doing this. A lot of your value comes from not just that you're the legal expert with the industry knowledge and years of experience solving these legal issues, but you know lots of really interesting, cool, useful people. You could introduce them to the client. That would either build goodwill, you just do it to be a nice guy, or you're doing it very pragmatically that you're offering an integrated tax and legal solution, which would get you more work. You know, So it doesn't just need to be for, for goodwill. And... You could even do a cross referral. So let's say you're a corporate lawyer and you've been invited on the beauty parade to do a pitch to the CEO of a company. You could say to them, hey, you know, this, uh, this corporate transaction actually will have some major employment issues. Please bring your HR director and I will bring our partner in charge of employment law. So you do a joint pitch with the um, employment partner. So that's giving you a synergy value proposition. And you're pitching not just to the CEO, but also to the HR director. So this becomes like a double date. There's a chance for you to foster that relationship with your contact. And there's a chance for your friend, that partner in employment, to foster the relationship with the HR director. So it increases your chances. And one plus one is three. There's a synergy here. You're adding extra value by having this other person. So keep in mind, you don't need to do a single solitary pitch or presentation. You can do matchmaking. You can do a cross referral, which is a cross sell and an active referral at the same time. Both of these would increase your chances. But like we saw before, whatever you do, we really don't want to have simply a wallflower. You don't want to be a partner coming along to a beauty parade and you have decoration of two lawyers behind you who sit looking pretty, doing nothing, saying nothing. Waste of time. You need to have a wingman, a wingwoman, someone who is going to add value and compliment you when you're doing your pitch. It can actually be much more persuasive and convincing and interesting if you can alternate your pitch between two or three pitchers, presenters, than just one person. So bear that in mind. Um, so I think that's really all I want to say at this point about the beauty parade pitching. And like I was mentioning, this would apply if you do tea marketing, you invite your client to tea, to lunch, to dinner, tea for two, or tea for three, you're doing cross selling, you're bringing one of your friends, and getting an active referral, you tell your client to bring one of their friends, you have these spoken conversation, go to public speaking, go to networking event, all of that body language that communicative sales approach for beauty parade pitching would apply. Briefly, because I mustn't be careful, I mustn't go over time too much. I want to look at L to L pitching. <clears throat> another book that I wrote, this is another topic that I train on, law firm to law firm pitching. If you go to a networking event <laughs> and you meet another lawyer, typically nothing happens further. What do I see most lawyers doing? They exchange business cards and they say, yeah, if we have a need in your jurisdiction, we'll contact you. Probably never going to happen. If we need a second opinion, we might reach you. I doubt it. Um, and then, of course, what often happens is in terms of L to L sales, a partner or a lawyer would do a roadshow. They would go, let's say, to London to meet English law firms, English partners. They might go to America even to do the same thing with American firms to New York. That's L to L pitching. Again, the typical scenario is a meet or greet meeting. You come to that meeting, they meet you, they give you tea, you greet them, you go home, nothing ever happens. There's no follow-up, there's no continuation afterwards. So how do you avoid this? 
Well, I wrote a paper uh, and it's called, And They Never Spoke Again. And this is specifically, how do you avoid a meet or greet meeting? If you meet a lawyer or a partner at a networking event, or if you go on a road show, you don't want to just have a meet and greet and go. I brainstormed and I came up with a dozen concepts, a dozen approaches that you can take to convert meet or greet into a meeting that actually generates mandates and then money. You can do the cross referral. Um, you can bring someone with you and ask them to bring someone and introduce them and therefore leverage that to increase your chances of success. You can suggest participation in an interview or an article or a study, and you really do it, and you use that to build a relation with them, to ask open questions, to identify needs that you can then propose. You could look at joint bundled pitching. Could you and that other lawyer, even if they're in the same jurisdiction, especially if they're in another jurisdiction, could you create a value proposition together and then to target your joint client base? Um, that would be something proactive that you could do. There could be some synergies of working with this other lawyer or other law firm. You need to work it out and then to do it, um, leveraging your relations that you have. You can do matchmaking together. So in any case, uh, I would like to be recommending to you avoid meet and greet. And I bet that you have had this kind of meeting and I bet you're gonna have this kind of meeting in future. You can have this in an L2B context. As a law firm, you come to a potential client, you meet and greet, you shake hands, you agree to meet, you agree to send each other emails and do something in future. Nothing ever happens. Waste of time. You have got to close. You have got to make follow-up. You've got to drive the process. If you're just going to come home and sit and wait and see when they're going to send you a mandate, you're going to wait for a very long time. So... If you're interested in L to L selling, L to L pitching, law firm to law firm roadshows, I think this is maybe more at partner or managing partner level. Um, drop me an email. I can share the article with you. I can. I have a book about this. I do training about this. I've got lots of ideas. So that's something for you to consider. Um, I think we're about to wrap up for today. Uh, you can see my upcoming visits. I've got one or two dozen countries I'm going to be visiting in the next month or so. Uh, if you notice that I'm going to be in one of your cities and you want to meet, let's have a coffee, let's have a chat. Um, I'm pretty sociable. Um, I promise not to do a hard sell to you. <laughs> uh, so I'm happy to meet you. And if if you if you see that I'm in one of your countries and you want to do something together you know, with your law firm, then of course that's that's possible since I'll be around. Um, and if you want a copy of these slides, email me, I'll send it to you. I learned just recently how to do hyperlinks to our video content of Nichedonia that I had forgotten we made before the pandemic. So for example, here, if you click on this, it'll take you to a video in YouTube telling you about Nichedonia. It's an introductory video, a few minutes. Same thing for the eight of my first books. I think I wrote these originally back 2017, 2018, uh, there's a three minute video explaining what this concept is and why it's important and why lawyers and partners should know this and be able to do it in legal sales. Uh, and of course I have textbooks for each of these and I do training on these topics. Now I've got about 24, 25 topics. So these are the first eight. I think these are the most useful, the most fundamental, not just for junior associates and associates, even at um, partner level. So if that's interesting, you can take a look at it. And then here are my socials, of course. I think the last thing I can say is, of course, please <laughs> subscribe to the Nichedonia channel. Then you will see when we're beginning to drop lectures and materials online, the different videos. We're going to start doing a series of Nichedonia shorts. So these will be like one minute videos on key concepts and sales. Um, we'll have a huge pipeline of them. Like, you know, I'm going to convert these concepts into videos as well. That's about 128. So that would be a few months. Um, yeah. So subscribe to the Nichedonia channel. And next week, it um, depends on when in time you're watching this broadcast. But next Wednesday, I'm going to do a one-off standalone session on legal writing. I wrote a book, The 36 Rules of Legal Writing, where I saw the common mistakes that lawyers make. I consolidated this into 36 rules, which cover about 90% of these mistakes. 
Uh, I'm going to do a free one hour live stream. I'm going to do it in Zoom and put it onto YouTube as well. If you're interested in joining that, drop me an email. If you're looking at this in the future after 22nd of February 2023, still drop me an email and I can send you a link to the recording. Okay, so I think that's all for today. We looked a little bit at Beauty Parade pitching and we touched on L to L pitching. And next Thursday, which is, if I'm not mistaken, um, 23rd of February, we'll have pitching four, the final topic on, on the pitching series, uh, which I think will be quite interesting. And then next month in March, 2023, we have the four next lectures, which will be covering cross-selling extremely interesting and useful topic for lawyers and partners you can make a lot of money from cross-selling but none of the law firms i've met are actually doing it very well <laughs> okay so thank you for your time and i hope to see you next next thursday thank you bye bye